for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ruth Langer, and I'm the associate director and the Jewish half of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning here at Boston College. I'm also uh, responsible for Jewish studies in the theology department here. I want to welcome you here today for what I know will be a very important discussion on Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik and interreligious dialogue 40 years later. Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik was one of the most, if not the most, important American Orthodox leader and thinker of the 20th century. Born in Belarus, Russia in 1903, he carried on his family's tradition of brilliant Talmudic scholarship, but he also received a PhD in Neo-Kantian epistemology from the University of Berlin, where he mastered the classics, philosophy, and theology of Western literature. In the early 1930s, he accepted a rabbinic position in Boston, where he lived until his death in 1993. His influence, though, reached far beyond Boston, especially because from the early 1940s on, he also served as the Rosh Yeshiva, the rabbinic head of the Rabbi Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary of the Yeshiva University. There he served as spiritual mentor and teacher to thousands of Orthodox rabbinic students. As a national and international leader of modern orthodoxy, he shaped its ideology, its religious philosophy, rabbinic education, law, and politics. His legacy is such that today, 10 years after his death, he remains the unrivaled spiritual guide of modern Orthodox Jews, and he's known as Harav, the rabbi. For the modern Orthodox community, his word was and is authoritative. His teachings are part of the traditions of the oral Torah with which one engages as one seeks to navigate our now 21st century reality. Forty years ago to this winter, Rabbi Soloveitchik delivered an essay titled Confrontation at the 1964 Midwinter Conference of the Rabbinic Council of America, addressing the question of how his community should respond to requests to enter into dialogue with Christians. The Rabbinical Council immediately adopted a statement in response to this presentation, rejecting any interreligious discussion not based on, quote, the full independence, religious liberty, and freedom of conscience of each faith community. In February 1966, two years later, the Council adopted a more concrete statement formulated by Rabbi Soloveitchik that called for Jewish Christian cooperation, quote, in the public world of humanitarian and cultural endeavors, and I skip some of the text here, on such topics as war and peace, poverty, freedom, moral values, secularism, technology, civil rights, etc. These topics were appropriate for cooperation, but it absolutely rejected dialogue on areas of faith, religious law, doctrine, and ritual. Following Rabbi Soloveitchik's argument in confrontation, it encouraged discussion of areas of universal concern, but rejected as futile and even dangerous discussion of the private realm specific to individual faith communities. This February 1966 statement came only months after the Second Vatican Council's promulgation of Nostra Aetate, with its radical rethinking of Catholic theology about Jews and Judaism, and its authoritative rejection of many of the bases of Christian anti-Semitism, as well as any actions that were based or might be based upon them. Nostra Aetate calls for finding understanding with Jews through, quote, biblical and theological inquiry and through friendly discussions. In the process of preparing this document, the Vatican had sought out just such dialogue with Jewish leaders. This itself was unprecedented for a church that had previously used most such dialogues as attempts to convert Jews. Confrontation in 1964 responded to this new situation of Nostra Aetate in the making, offering guidance to a community that, fresh from the fires of the Holocaust, was understandably uncertain how to respond to these friendly overtures. The 1966 rabbinic statement confirms that these teachings were the accepted policy of the modern Orthodox community in America. We stand here, 40 years later, in a world where Catholic implementation of Nostra Aetate has made great strides, and where many Protestant churches have similarly addressed their heritages of anti-Judaism. 
We live in a world where many see the move to theological dialogue to be the logical next step in building positive relations between Christians and Jews. Indeed, Christian theologians seeking to address the deeper sources of Christian anti-Judaism want and even need to do so in dialogue with Jews. This situation, the reality of a Christian and especially a Catholic world that genuinely seeks to build new and positive relationships with Jews, is the reason that we have convened this symposium. It grows from conversations that I have had with Orthodox rabbis who are themselves engaged in dialogue with Christians. Among these are Eugene Korn, our primary speaker today, and also Rabbi David Rosen, who has been doing some equivalent work and who was unable to join us. Our task is not to confront or even to re-examine confrontation. Instead, we ask today, how do Jews who take the Rav's teaching seriously read, interpret, and apply his teaching in confrontation to a changed world? And with that, I have said enough. And I want to introduce now our Eugene Korn, who will be our primary speaker. After he is finished, uh, we will probably, I think we will take a short break. And then we will have three respondents to his talk another break, and then discussion among the respondents and discussions with, with all of you. So Rabbi Eugene Korn is a consultant on interfaith affairs. He serves as adjunct professor of Jewish thought in the Department of Christian Jewish Studies at Seton Hall University in South Orange, New Jersey. And he is the editor of the Eda Journal, a forum of mo modern orthodox discourse. He was ordained by the Israeli rabbinate and he holds a doctorate in philosophy from Columbia University. Previously, he served as National Director of Interfaith Affairs for the Anti-Defamation League and Senior Research Fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. He is the author of numerous scholarly articles on Jewish philosophy, theology, and ethics, and he is currently editing a book on Jewish-Christian relations and writing a book on the significance of Tselem Elohim, the image of God, in Jewish ethics and law. With that, I'd like to, in to invite uh, Dr. Korn to address us. Thank you, Professor Langer. And thank you to, Bo to Boston College and the Center for Christian Jewish Learning, uh, and to Professor Cunningham, a good friend and good colleague. Uh, and I, I would say personally that I'm honored to be on the panel together with Professors Berger, Cunningham, and Rabbi Clapper. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to come to Boston for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that I have some family in Boston. Um, my son had the good sense to marry a young woman from Newton, Massachusetts, um, so it's wonderful to come here and to, and to see family. And lastly, I'm not too proud to admit that I'm a long-suffering Boston Red Sox fan. And uh, after this year, I decided that when I don't root for the Red Sox, I'm going to root for the Florida Marlins. Uh, uh, in Boston College, uh, a place of deep religious commitment, and in, th in a discussion of the re religious worldview of Rav Soloveitchik, it's appropriate to begin with a prayer. And in this case, I offer a traditional and personal prayer uh, before I begin my analysis of the topic. The Babylonian Talmud in Brachot records that one Talmudic sage, Rav Nechunya ben Hakana, used to say a prayer when he entered the Beit HaMidrash, the study hall. He used to say that when I enter the study hall, I pray that no error should occur through me. And when I leave the study hall, I express thankfulness for my lot. I personally pray that I do not in any way misrepresent the teachings of Rav Soloveitchik today or the positions of the Catholic Church in my remarks that follow. And it is also my fervent hope that today's symposium will contribute to greater understanding between Jews and Catholics and that we'll all be able to give thanks for this after the symposium ends. Now before I begin my analysis, I hasten to make a correction uh, to a recent statement that appeared in the press over the weekend. I do not disagree in any way with Rav Soloveitchik. Uh, Rav Soloveitchik is one of my spiritual teachers, 
Uh, for those of you who have been to my study, uh, you know that there's actually a portrait of Rav Soloveitchik amongst all of my books. Um, quite the contrary. Um, I wish to defend him against his critics, as you'll soon hear, uh, who I believe uh, misread him. I would never have the temerity to, quote, take on Rav Soloveitchik, as the uh, press statement said erroneously. Um, I wish to do him honor by closely reading his essay, Confrontation, and try to understand his position in light of today's reality. Now, what I'll try to do, first of all, is to analyze the logical status of the essay confrontation, because that's been subject to some debate. And secondly, talk about the three different types of arguments that he poses in confrontation. And lastly, discuss the nature of dialogue and where I think Rav Soloveitchik's reflections would lead to the contemporary conception of theological dialogue. Confrontation is divided into two parts. The first, a 12-page philosophical description of three levels of human existence that draws heavily on the biblical account of the creation of the human being in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. The second part is a 13-page discussion of Jewish responsibilities to humanity, and specifically, how faithful Jews should relate to other faith communities part theological reflection, part biblical exegesis, and part existential statement, confrontation bears Rav Soloveitchik's spiritual signature of bold, eclectic integration and noble vision. Given its practical impact and Rav Soloveitchik's multifaceted persona in the Orthodox community, it's important to understand correctly the nature and the function of the essay. Rav Soloveitchik often spoke as the community's chief halachic authorities, authority, a kind of rabbi's rabbi, hence uh, the term the rav, the, the rabbi of our community. And many have understood the essay to constitute a psak halacha, a legal opinion that formally obligates the rav's followers and that could only be overridden by an authority greater than Rav Soloveitchik. I find it very difficult to sustain this categorization of confrontation. The traditional language of halachic responsa, of chuvot, is Hebrew, not English. Secondly, the essay is devoid of any classic material that all chuvot rely upon as a basis for legal analysis. That is, formal biblical imperatives, Talmudic opinions and commentary, post-Talmudic rabbinic legal decisions. Conspicuously absent in the essay, is any citation of the great rabbinic authorities, such as Maimonides, Rav Menachem Hamiri, Rav Yosef Cairo, Rav Moshe Isserlis, or of any halachic code, even though they had much to say regarding Christianity. Lastly, the method of argumentation bears no resemblance whatsoever to classic halachic analysis. No legal principles are articulated, no halachic reasoning appears, no precedent is cited, and no legal conclusion is stated. The formal halachic terms asur, forbidden, or mutar, permitted, never appear in the essay, nor is there any mention of the terms halacha or mitzvah. Now, if you want to really see the contrast between confrontation and halachic responsa, um, it's very conspicuous if, if you compare the essay to what indeed is a formal tshuva, a formal responsum, on the question of meeting Catholics for the purpose of interfaith dialogue. That tshuva was offered by Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. It took Ra Rabbi Feinstein not 25 pages, but merely one column to close the issue. In two paragraphs, he ruled that interfaith dialogue violated a Torah commandment, and he stressed the absolute prohibition of such activities for Jews. It's instructive to note that shortly after Rabbi Feinstein's 1967 responsum, he beseeched Rav Soloveitchik to sign a statement formally, quote, declaring an absolute and clear prohibition, end quote, for Jews to participate in interfaith dialogue. There is no evidence that Rav Soloveitchik ever responded to Rabbi Feinstein's request. The crucial difference is not one of style or argumentation, but function. Rabbi Feinstein penned a classic response in halachic terms, while Rav Soloveitchik argued discursively on philosophical, historical, and prudential grounds regarding the correct parameters of Jewish-Catholic dialogue. 
The essay is more of a philosophical disquisition, that is part one, with a direct political application, part two. Most assuredly, therefore, Rav Soloveitchik wrote confrontation as a thesis that argues for a particular Jewish policy on interfaith dialogue, not as a psak halacha. Now let's turn to the arguments presented in confrontation. Rav Soloveitchik's substantive arguments regarding interfaith dialogue all appear in part two of the essay. In that section, he advances three different types of arguments that are interwoven throughout the discussion. The first is a philosophical argument about the nature and limits of human com communication. The second is a doctrinal argument that assumes faithful Catholics are bound by specific theological claims regarding Jews and Judaism. And the third is a historical argument based on Jewish attitudes conditioned by the painful historical experiences that Jews endured in their troubled relations with the church. The, philosoph the philosophic argument rests on the alleged intrinsic character of communication, and therefore seems independent of contingent empirical conditions or social context. That is, if the argument is valid, it is eternally so, because its conclusions follow from the very nature of human communication. The doctrinal argument, however, is different in that it depends primarily on the validity of the assumptions about the limits of Catholic and Jewish doctrinal commitments, as well as presuppositions about the function and dynamics of dialogue. These are variables, for both doctrine and dialogue can change at different points in history. As such, the doctrinal argument is contingent, depending upon whether these assumptions are correct at any given time. The historical argument, rooted in reactions to the past, is similarly contingent, since attitudes can change over time, particularly when historical, social, and intellectual conditions undergo fundamental shifts. In other words, the validity of these latter arguments during the Middle Ages, or the first half of the 20th century, is no assurance that they are valid for the 21st century, or for a different understanding of the dialogical encounter. Now let's look at the philosophic argument. Rev. Soloveitchik contends that each faith community is unique, and therefore any attempt to equate them is, quote, absurdity. From this uniqueness, he concludes the following, and I quote, the word of faith reflects the intimate, private, and paradoxically inexpressible cravings of the individual for his maker, which is totally incomprehensible to the man of a different faith community. Or again, quote, the great encounter between God and man is a wholly personal private affair, incomprehensible to the outsider, even to the brother of the same faith community. The divine message is incommunicable since it defies all standardized media of information and all objective categories. As a result, theological dialogue, as opposed to dialogue on social, ethical, or political matters, between Jews and non-Jews is futile. Readers of Rav's, academic readers of Rav Soloveitchik have claimed that this position is incoherent. First and foremost, Rav Soloveitchik spent his entire life teaching Torah and, hal and Halakha, Judaism's divine logos. His conception of God's word assumes that it is logical and it is communicable to finite human beings. In the tradition of Maimonides, we shall see that he believed that the Torah of God can be taught not only to Jews, but also to Christians. Second, according to his logic, it would seem that a Jew can no more successfully communicate his religious experience to another Jew than to a Christian. But Rav Soloveitchik himself attempted to communicate his religious experience to both Jews and Christians. His most famous and perhaps most personal theological confession the lonely man of faith, was delivered to an interfaith audience at St. John's Catholic Seminary, not very far from here, I assume, right, in Brighton, Massachusetts. In that work, he takes up the generic human problem of interpersonal communication and concludes that Adam and Eve were able to communicate with each other because they formed the universal covenantal community with God. Well before there was any idea of a particular covenant, that separated Jews from Gentiles. The final argument of his critics notes that Rav Soloveitchik read Christian and heterodox Jewish philosophers and theologians. 
He was deeply influenced by the scholastics, Kant, Schleiermacher, Scheller, Kierkegaard, Bergson, Barth, Otto, and other theologians. His language and philosophy clearly indicate that these thinkers helped shape his experience of Kedusha, of holiness, of tshuva, of repentance, and the entire texture of his religious life. How then could he claim in confrontation that Jews and Christians should not talk to each other about faith experience because such dialogue was impossible, even absurd? Of course, it is a truism that subjective experience, be it of faith, of love, beauty, or awe, can never be totally captured by language. Religious language is, at best, only an exact metaphor, a finite approximation of infinity or of numinous experience. Yet surely linguistic expression is valuable as a helpful intimation. As Rob Soloveitchik himself admits in a wonderful volume that has just come out, and I urge all of you to, to read it. It's called uh, uh, Worship of the Heart. Just as a lover cannot stop attempting to describe his love feelings, the religious person is compelled to, to express his religious experience, however inadequately. So those are the critics' arguments against the Rav's position in confrontation. And I believe that all these critiques are unfounded. Rav Soloveitchik's dismissal of religious dialogue as absurd does not refer to the personal expression of faith, but to proof or refutation of faith. As an existentialist who believed that the deepest yearnings and satisfactions of human life were not intellectual, Rav Soloveitchik maintained that the foundations of Jewish faith were located in the experiences of the Jewish people, in the traditions of our patriarchs, and in the passional life of individual Jews. What was absurd to Rav Soloveitchik was any attempt at rational demonstration, scriptural analysis, or logical deduction to prove or to disprove faith. Perhaps this is why he frequently talked of Kierkegaard, but rarely of Anselm. And more to the point in confrontation, any interfaith discussion that utilizes arguments to refute the faith of another is hostile and dishonest, not merely logically confused. The essay makes clear that Rav Soloveitchik's primary objection on both logical and moral grounds was to doctrinal disputation between Christians and Jews regarding the validity of Judaism. That is, the traditional Christian Jewish debates imposed on Jews by the church from medieval time onward. His sense of concern and resentment at this unequal form of dialogue is palpable in the essay. Let me just quote two passages that indicate this. Quote, any intimation, overt or covert, on the part of the community of the many, that it, that it is expected of the community of the few to shed its uniqueness and cease existing because it has fulfilled its mission by paving the way for the community of the many, must be rejected as undemocratic and contravening the very idea of religious freedom. Or, second quote, we must always remember that our singular commitment to God and our hope and indomitable will for survival are non-negotiable and non-rationalizable, and are not subject to debate or argumentation. Rav Soloveitchik's assumptions that these were the Catholic goals for theological dialogue was historically warranted. It was 1963-1964, almost two years before Nostra Aetate was written, and the church still adhered to its age-old theological posture regarding Jews and Judaism. The church then held that Jews were guilty of deicide, that Christianity had superseded the old covenant of Judaism, that extra ecclesium nullus salus, that conversion and contempt were the religiously correct Christian policies toward Jews. It was therefore logical to assume that modern Catholic Jewish dialogue would not depart essentially from the assumptions and logic of medieval disputations. These disputations were designed to prove, in the words of one scholar, that the truth of Christianity would be rendered manifest to destroy the errors of the Jews, that Jesus was the Messiah, that the Jewish legal and ceremonial rules were discontinued and were never to be resumed after Jesus. In other words, it was not dialogue of respect and equality at all, but a theological duel to the death that Jews could not afford to win or to lose. 
Hence, Rav Soloveitchik rejected Jews entering into theological discussions under this Catholic frame of reference, as he referred to it, since at best it would render Judaism only a satellite in Christianity's orbit. It is this critical distinction between respectfully hearing the religious voices of others and doctrinal disputation that resolves the alleged contradiction between Rav Soloveitchik's private conversation with Christian religious thinkers, whose insights he integrated into his religious life, and his rejection of formal interfaith dialogue on theological subjects. The former posed no threat to the validity of his faith, while he assumed that the latter was targeted at undermining Jewish faith commitment. To employ the favorite technique of Rav Soloveitchik's brisker Talmudic tradition, there are two concepts of theological discourse. One is authentic dialogue, which is, which is the free expression and is governed by legitimacy of difference and mutual respect. The other is polemical disputation, which is futile in its illogic and objectionable in its triumphalism. So let's turn to the doctrinal argument. Rav Soloveitchik's understanding of the traditional Catholic doctrine brought to light what he called the incommensurate frames of reference that rendered Catholic Jewish theological discussion absurd. He believed that the Catholic faithful would necessarily bring supersessionist assumptions to their conversations with Jews. They would assume that Christianity had replaced Judaism, that Judaism had lost its continuing spiritual vitality, that it no longer had a divine mission to the future of humanity, and that contemporary Jews who refused to accept Christian doctrine were simply blind to the fulfillment of God's covenant. By virtue of this, quote, Catholic frame of reference, unquote, Catholics would have no choice but to view Judaism as inferior and incomplete, and hence attempt to convert Jews to Christianity. Trying to harmonize this worldview with the Jewish commitment to the living validity of Judaism and Torah, and with the pride in Jewish survival, was indeed a futile and dangerous exercise from which no good could come. As a result, Rav Soloveitchik stipulated in confrontation four specific preconditions for Jewish-Christian dialogue. One, there must be an acknowledgement that the Jewish people is an independent faith community endowed with intrinsic wor worth, to be viewed against its own meta-historical backdrop. Two, the Jewish singular commitment to God and hope for survival are non-negotiable and not subject to debate or argumentation. Three, Jews should refrain from recommending changes to Christian doctrine, for such recommendations would lead to reciprocal Christian recommendations for changes to Jewish belief. Change must emerge autonomously from within, for, quote, Non-interference is a sine qua non for goodwill and mutual respect, end quote. And lastly, each community has, must articulate its position that the other community has a right to live, create, and worship God in its own way, in freedom, and in dignity. Both communities have a right to an unconditional commitment to God that is lived with a sense of pride, security, dignity, and joy in being what they are. This precludes trading favors on fundamental matters of faith, or reconciling differences out of an obligation to compromise. Now, when Rav Soloveitchik penned Confrontation in 1964, he probably could not have foreseen the transformation in Catholic doctrine and the radical shift in this Catholic frame of reference that was to follow. Almost two years later, the Vatican's proclamation of Nostra Aetate began a theological journey that continues until this day, and from which Christianity will likely never return. The transformation of the Catholic frame of reference can be evaluated by examining current Catholic teachings on six subjects. What one Catholic theologian, Sister Mary Boys at the Union Theological Seminary has dubbed the six R's. Okay. Number one, the repudiation of anti-Semitism. Number two, the rejection of the charge of deicide. Number three, repentance after the Shoah. Four, review of teaching about Jews and Judaism, five, the recognition of Israel, and six, rethinking of proselytizing Jews. And I'll just give you a kind of brief overview as to what happened, uh, uh, as how I see this transformation. Perhaps Professor Cunningham will go into uh, more detail. There's a rich literature on this, so I'll just give you a brief overview as I see it. 
Nostra Aetate achieved two explicit changes in Catholic theology that were reinforced and expanded upon by two other authoritative Vatican documents, the first being guidelines and suggestions for implementing the consular declaration Nostra Aetate, which I'll refer to as guidelines that came out in 1974, and the second is notes on the correct way to present Jews and Judaism in preaching and teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, which I'll refer to as notes, that came out in 1985. The first point of Nostra Aetate, so critical to Jewish-Catholic relations, was the repudiation of anti-Semitism. The Church's statement on anti-Semitism is one of the most categorical rejections made by any institution or group. It reads as follows. Remembering then her common heritage with the Jews, and moved not by any political consideration, but solely by the religious motivation of Christian charity, she deplores all hatreds, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism leveled at any time from any source against the Jews. The latter two documents strengthen the rejection by changing the verb deplore to condemn. I believe that Jewish, uh, with, because of certain Jewish uh, insistence, and still later, Pope John Paul II repeatedly stated that anti-Semitism is no mere crime, but, quote, a sin against God and humanity. Secondly, Nostra Aetate officially put, the rest, put to rest the noxious idea that the Jewish people is collectively guilty of deicide, a charge that was the primary theological source of Christian anti-Semitism throughout history, and that led Christians to shed so much Jewish blood. It reads as follows. What happened in Jesus' passion cannot be charged against all Jews without distinction, then alive, nor against Jews of today. Although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God. This point was also strengthened in notes when the document stated, quote, Christians are more responsible than those few Jews because we sin knowingly, end quote. Now, it's important for Jews to recognize that Nostra Aetate represents the highest teaching authority in the Catholic Church. All the world's bishops, including the Bishop of Rome, speaking in solemn council, and that most of the other documents that I cite are the official teaching of the Catholic Magisterium, or formal teaching authority. I am certain that there are still Catholic traditionalists, some of them in Hollywood, <laughs> some of them wearing red skull caps in Rome, who dissent from the new church teaching, but they cannot correctly be said to represent Catholic doctrine today. Their dissenting opinions carry little ecclesiastical weight and do not determine church policy toward Jews or Judaism. The third point, the rejection, the rejection of both anti-Semitism and deicide are addressed explicitly and unequivocally in Nostra Aetate. In my judgment, these points require little conceptual or theological development. The main challenge today is not the clarification of these above points, but their broad promulgation and implementation throughout the Catholic community around the world. The Shoah was the catalyst for the transformation of Christian teaching about Jews and Judaism. Reflection on the unimaginable evil, unimaginable evil of the Holocaust became the seed for Christian reappraisal of its tortured history and theology regarding Jews. Many Christians recoiled at the horror of the Shoah and sensed the causal connection between it and centuries of anti-Christian, anti-Jewish Christian teachings. Nostra Aetate does not mention the Holocaust, but guidelines refers to it as the historical setting of Nostra Aetate, while notes mandates the development of Holocaust curricula in Catholic education to help in understanding the meaning for Jews of Shoah and its consequences. The most direct admission of Catholic guilt and responsibility for its role in the Shoah came in a remarkable statement by the Catholic bishops of Germany in 1995 and the French bishop's statement, the Declaration of Repentance that appeared in 1997. The Vatican issued its formal statement, we remember, in March 1998. This document is far from perfect and has been justly and, uh, and unjustly criticized by Jews and Catholics alike. It expresses itself with classic Vatican diplomatic ambiguity, what Sister Boys has termed church speak. And unlike the statements of the German and French bishops, I believe it equivocates on the critical issue of the church role in the Shoah. Notwithstanding these problems, 
We remember, Marx, a clear recognition of the complicity of Christian authorities in the Holocaust. Utilizing the Hebrew term tshuva, so dear to Jews, it states the need for Christian repentance and sincerely appeals to Jewish people for forgiveness. Pope John Paul II later reinforced the Catholic recognition of guilt when he visited Yad Vashem Memorial and the Kotel in, in Jerusalem in March of 2000. He said the following, God of our fathers, you chose Abraham and his descendants to bring your name to the nations. We are deeply saddened by the behavior of those who in the course of history have caused these children of yours to suffer. Asking forgiveness, we wish to commit ourselves to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant. Let me say a few things about the significance of the recognition of the State of Israel. Already in 1956, Rav Soloveitchik articulated the theological implications of the State of Israel for Judaism and Christianity in his essay, Kol Dodi Do Feik. The return of the Jewish people to their biblical homeland and, permanent, and the permanent existence of the State of Israel forced a de facto recognition upon the Christian world that Jews were not destined to be cursed and humiliated because of their rejection of Christianity. The existence of Israel constituted an empirical refutation of Augustine's doctrine of wandering Jews functioning theologically as negative witnesses to the truth of Christianity. When the Vatican refused to recognize the state of Israel until 1994, church officials claimed that its position was purely political. Recognition would endanger the welfare of Christians in Arab lands, and the Vatican policy was to withhold recognitions to states that lacked fixed borders. While these political claims were undoubtedly true, Rav Soloveitchik understood that there was something deeper than politics at stake. Lack of recognition was tantamount to denying that Jews had the right, that they had the right to go home to their biblical homeland because of the doctrines of contempt and supersessionism that nullified continuing Jewish covenantal integrity were still operative in church theology. It took 29 years after Nostra Aetate for the church to recognize the state of Israel in June 1994. However late, such recognition constituted, willy-nilly, as Rav Soloveitchik used to like to say, de jure recognition of the Jewish people's right to its biblical homeland. As such, it is an implicit affirmation of the validity of the Jewish covenant and a repudiation of the Augustinian doctrine with its supersessionist denigration of Judaism. The existing Vatican recognition of Israel is now official church policy and testifies to another monumental shift in the Catholic frame of reference. Theologically, Nostra Aetate opened the door to new thinking, not, merely about, not only about Jews, but about how Catholics should understand Judaism. In a remarkable exegetical move that was pointed out to me by Professor Cunningham, Nostra Aetate rejected the plain meaning of Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 12, and affirmed the continuing validity of God's biblical covenant with the Jewish people. It said as follows, Jews remain most dear to God because of their fathers, for he does not repent of the gifts he makes, nor of the calls he issues. A strict reading of the statement might yield a salutary claim about Jews alone, but not their covenant with God, that is Judaism. Moreover, Nostra Aetate explicitly presents the church as the new people of God. One could continue to cling to the doctrine of supersessionism as meaning that the Jewish covenant is no longer, value, is no longer valid. But this logical possibility was foreclosed in the explicit statement of Pope John Paul II in 1980 that later became official doctrine when it was incorporated into notes. He said, Jews are the people of God of the Old Testament, which has never been revoked by God. The permanence of Israel is a historic fact to be interpreted within God's design. It remains a chosen people. The Pope's words imply that the permanence of Israel is a positive theological value, not merely a neutral fact of history. In other words, it is God's design that Israel's chosenness has not been canceled or superseded. This reading can be explosive for traditional Christian theology. How far-reaching are its implications? Does it mean that Jews, does it mean that for Jews, Judaism is the highest fulfillment of God's design, much as Christianity is the highest fulfillment for the rest of humanity? If so, 
Does Judaism have the same power of saving grace as does Christianity? Does it follow that attempts to convert Jews to Christianity are no longer necessary or even desirable in fact or in theory? Is Christianity universal for all except for the Jews who remain in the covenant of Abraham? Let me map out three distinct positions as I see them um, that try to answer these questions. Following the trajectory of recent church statements about Judaism, a number of American Catholic theologians, some of them at Boston College, have gone just that far by answering yes to all of these questions. In August 2002, they presented a paper, Reflections on Covenant and Mission, in which they asserted that Judaism is salvific for Jews and that campaigns that target Jews for conversion to Christianity are no longer theologically acceptable in the Catholic Church. In effect, as I read that statement, they have proclaimed that Judaism is in some way theologically equal to Christianity. Now this caused controversy in the United States and in Rome. For other Catholic theologians were by no means prepared to grant equivalent legitimacy to Judaism. Cardinal Walter Casper, an ardent supporter of Catholic Jewish dialogue, who as president of the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews, is the Vatican's highest authority in charge of Catholic Jewish relations, has equivocated on whether in fact Judaism is salvific for Jews in the way that Christianity is for Christians. In a speech in Montevideo, Uruguay in July 2001, as well in as in a speech at Boston College in November 2002, he stated that Judaism was in fact, quote, salvific, unquote, for Jews. Tellingly, this important statement was omitted from the official transcript of his Montevideo speech. Perhaps he had gone too far for some in Rome, and even for himself, for he later distanced himself from the position espoused in the document Reflections on Covenant and Mission, and he announced that that paper did not represent his position. Perhaps he is still working out a more refined formulation of his thoughts on this matter. Most importantly, however, Cardinal Casper has consistently renounced any attempt at proselytizing Jews to Christianity, both in fact and in theory. In both Jer Jerusalem and Boston, he argued forcefully that Christianity must approach Judaism with equality and respect for differences, and that there is no mission to the Jews, either in dialogue or outside of it. There is only mission with the Jews. A third and less equivocal position is held by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith at the Vatican. He adamantly rejects the notion of theological equality or pluralism. He denies any limitation on the unicity and universality of the salvific mission of Jesus, or any implication that Christianity is not the highest fulfillment of God's word to all on earth. Quote, the Sinai Covenant is indeed superseded, end quote. Yet, as Professor Berger has so ably demonstrated, Cardinal Ratzinger maintains that theological unification, that is, the conversion of Jews to, to Christianity, is hardly possible within his, our historical time, perhaps not even desirable. In other words, Cardinal Ratzinger is an eschatological supersessionist, maintaining that the replacement of Judaism and Christianity will not take place in our lifetime before the eschaton. If so, Cardinal Ratzinger's form of supersessionism should play no part in the dynamic of pre-Messianic relations. This means that it should pose no, neither a threat to Jews today nor to Catholic Jewish dialogue that respects the profound theological differences between Judaism. Traditional Jews should find neither difficulty nor discomfort with Cardinal Ratzinger's eschatological supersessionism. And to students of Rav Soloveitchik, it should sound eerily familiar. It is the near exact parallel orthodoxy of Rav Soloveitchik's eschatological convictions that he presents in confrontation. Here's what he says in confrontation. Only a candid, frank, and unequivocal policy of reflecting our unconditional commitment to God Believing with great passion in the ultimate truthfulness of our views, praying fervently for and expecting confidently the fulfillment of our eschatological vision, when our faith will rise from particularity to universality, will impress our peers of the other faith community. Rav Soloveitchik, too, believed that the truthfulness of his faith will spread universally at the end of time. 
Thus we arrive at an important and somewhat comforting divine paradox. Cardinal Ratzinger's supersessionism forms not a threat in dialogue, but an actual protector of the rights of Jews to articulate their own creed. That is, when dialogue is conducted with equal rights and respect, the orthodoxy of Catholic faith logically entails the validity of Orthodox Jews expressing their own parallel dreams and convictions. Whatever the proper trajectory of current Catholic thought is regarding supersessionism, whether it's the wide arc of the American Catholic theologians or the more acute angle of Cardinal Ratzinger, the most important facts for Catholic Jewish dialogue and for Rav Soloveitchik's legitimate concerns are that today there is no Catholic missionary organization for Jews and that conversion has no place in contemporary Catholic approach to dialogue with Jews. In the words of Cardinal Casper, uh, dialogue implies witness of my deepest faith, a witness which proposes but by no means imposes one's own faith. On the contrary, it implies respect for every other conviction and every other faith. In dialogue, Jews give witness to their faith, and Christians give account of the hope that they have in Jesus Christ. In doing so, both are far away from any kind of proselytism. Let me turn briefly to the historical argument that Rav Soloveitchik presents. In 1964, barely two decades separated Jews from the, Christian from the centuries of Christian contempt that culminated in the Shoah. The wounds were still raw. Whatever theological or philosophical issues stood in the way of rapprochement with Christendom, the Jewish people were in no existential condition to overcome the problematics of the past. In fact, the Jewish people had then yet to come to grips with the full impact of the hol Holocaust for themselves and with the full implications of the State of Israel. Lastly, I might add that the traditional Orthodox community was uncertain of its faith and of its ability to withstand the onslaught of modern values and sociology. In other words, 1964 was a time of internal healing of the Jewish people, introspecting, introspection for the Jewish community, and great guardedness for orthodoxy. In this state of existential and historical pain, Rav Soloveitchik alludes to the problems of dialogue for Jews at this time. Non-Jewish society, I quote, non-Jewish society has confronted us through the ages in a mood of defiance, as if we were part of a subhuman objective order, separated by an abyss from the human. Quote, we have not been authorized by our history, sanctioned by the martyrdom of millions, to even hint to another faith community that we are mentally ready to revise historical attitudes, to trade favors pertaining to fundamental matters of faith, or to reconcile some differences with them. It is now 40 years later, and as in all human relationships, timing is critical. Perhaps we still cannot make theological or moral sense of the Shoah, but our historical and existential position has changed. The final solution, the wounds of the final solution are still with us, yet we have begun to rehabilitate ourselves physically and spiritually. Christianity is no longer our aggressive physical or ideological enemy. Jews and Christians face the same mortal threat from radical Islam. And perhaps today, the Jewish people is better able to relate to those Christian faithful who display no triumphalist posture toward us. Rav Soloveitchik speaks of two separate problems. One, trading favors on matters of faith. And two, revising historical attitudes. Faith is precious. And here again, Rabbi Berger is also quite correct. Faith must never be sacrificed on the altar of social acceptance or of Western etiquette. And any such demand by others is the paragon of disrespect and denigration. Historical attitudes toward Christianity are quite another matter. Here, there's no timeless standard of correct. Of course, some Jews may feel the pain is still too great for venturing out into the world. But many feel otherwise. Ultimately, this is a matter of subjective judgment. And there is no objective method to determine whether it is too soon to redeem the past by attempting to build a better future through positive engagement with the Christian world. Rav Soloveitchik and the RCA were, were correct in rejecting any debate of private, private religious commitment. All argumentation, disputation, and attempted refutation of the basis of faith 
are zero-sum games between antagonists. These are exercises that Jews must shun. This position was true in 1964, and it is true today. Yet a different concept of dialogue has emerged. It focuses on the phenomenological expression of one's spiritual experience in the presence of others who are committed to mutual respect and forswearing proselytizing motive. It does not attack the grounds of faith. Some have categorized it as the expression of a religious anthropology. It would seem that such a conception would satisfy Rav Soloveitchik's conditions for theological engagement, namely, one, acknowledgement of the Jewish people as a vital faith community, two, non-negotiability of, of Jewish faith commitment to God, three, mutual respect and non-interference in the faith of the other, and four, agreement that each community has the right to live, create, and worship God in its own way, in freedom and dignity. I see no reason why Jews who venture into theological dialogue uh, with others should not lay down these as preconditions, and no reason why, given the transformation in the Catholic frame of reference, the church should not agree to them. If we follow Cardinal Casper's understanding, dialogue is not the antagonist, antagonistic confrontation of Jacob and Esau, of which Rav Soloveitchik spoke in 1964 but an expression of the natural human need for sharing, for catharsis of one's deepest religious beliefs, and for spiritual clarification with understanding and empathetic listeners. I believe this is what in fact occurred that afternoon in Brighton when Rav Soloveitchik presented the lonely man of faith to Catholics and Jews. None of the objectives present, uh, objections presented in confrontation apply to that special event. Nor, I believe, do they obtain in current theological dialogue, dialogue that's conducted with authentic yet respectful frames of reference. Now let me end with a few observations about the value of theological dialogue. The loss of one-third of the Jewish people in the Shoah, the security of Israel, assimilation, anti-Semitism, and the alienation of so many Jews from their spiritual heritage weigh heavily upon Jews today. With these issues that imperil our, our survival still raging, should Jews add theological dialogue with Christians to our already crowded list of religious challenges? Confronting the religious other is surely a difficult and problematic task. Even if permissible, why divert our limited energies from these internal survivalist goals? For religious Jews, there are objective and subjective answers to these questions. God, through his covenant with us, demands that the Jewish people strive for more than survival. The Torah asks us to bear testimony to God's presence and to his authority on earth. Like our forefathers Abraham and Jacob, we today are no less charged to call the name of the Lord, as, the, as Genesis repeatedly tells us and to make known God's name wherever we can. Religious Jews do not use this biblical phrase frequently, but that does not mean that it is not a central mitzvah for us. The important imperative of Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name, may be the rabbinic formulation of this, rabbinic, of this biblical charge to call the name of the Lord. God has challenged us to not be a mute people, or as Rav Soloveitchik phrased it, to be a message-bearing people, charged with charisma, a charismatic people that articulates its faith. We are destined to be more than a sect, a historical curiosity relegated to a footnote in history. We are bidden to be a people who teach righteousness and justice to the world, as it says in Genesis chapter 18, and who influence the great drama of human history. As God proclaimed through the prophet Isaiah, you are my witnesses. This is the meaning of the election of Israel and the very raison d'etre of our faith. But how can we call the name of the Lord today? The postmodern secular culture that engulfs us all is skeptical, positivist, anthropocentric, and autonomy-driven in its essence. It ridicules the concept of objective truth. It sees the human being as a material or an exclusively biological phenomenon one with little hope for self-transcendence or contact with eternity. Because modern man creates his reality via a Cartesian proclamation of cogito or a Nietzschean assertion of will, 
modern man is denied the natural rootedness in a tradition or a world greater than himself. Our contemporary culture adores moral utilitarianism and axiological relativism. And now, religious fanaticism has become so common that for many it is difficult to distinguish between religious legitimacy and idolatry that manifests itself in violence and extremism. All religions have been traumatized by modern and postmodern culture. And every traditional Jew today stands as a lonely man of faith before predominant Western thinking. In our cultural milieu, how can we call the name of the Lord? We must speak seriously about our fundamental conviction in Torah Min HaShemayim, that our holy texts come from a transcendent authority who is, who is the creator of heaven and earth, and not from some anonymous sage of antiquity. But who will listen to Jews of faith when we proclaim our commitment to an ageless tradition that claims us a priori, one that we cannot simply dismiss when it is, it is, it, it is at odds with popular culture? Who will believe that Jews live in covenant with God because the divine chose the Jewish people for a sacred mission? Who, underst who understands us when we discuss our ethical commitments that are based upon the metaphysical axiom that each person is created in God's holy image, and therefore all human life has intrinsic sanctity? To whom can we express our conviction that human history will be redeemed at the end of time, even though natural historical analysis seems to undermine any warranted belief in moral progress? And finally, as Rev. Soloveitchik so eloquently put it, who will appreciate our religious trials and dilemmas, the meaning of our spiritual challenges that derive from our commitment to infuse the world with holiness through a creed that has no technical potential, that cannot be evaluated by the rules of formal logic or measured by functional utilitarian society? My experience is that once Jews leave the safe intimacy of their synagogues, Faithful Catholics who have renounced triumphalism and accepted what Pope John Paul II has called their shared spiritual patrimony with Judaism are amongst the few who understand Jewish religious and spiritual dilemmas. Although they function in distinct and sometimes radically different categories, members of both faiths face the same loneliness and many similar problems that arise from striving to live a hallowed tradition and striving to find God in the postmodern world. Jews have a religious task to give testimony, to express the truths of our faith and the dilemmas of our spiritual experience. And Rav Soloveitchik was one who felt existentially and spiritually compelled to express himself on these matters. Let me just quote the beginning of Lonely Man of Faith. Quote, all I want to do is to follow the advice given Elihu, the son of Barachel of old, who said, I will speak that I may find relief, for there is redemptive quality for an agitated mind in the spoken word. The Torah's message, says Rav Soloveitchik, is the translation of the numinous into, to, into the charismatic, the translation of the nonsensical and absurd into the vernacular of the teleological and the rational. The Torah aims to discover caritas in majestas, kindness in beauty, and familiarity in strangeness. Can we not attempt to express these religious impulses with Christians who share our quest for eternity, who relate to us as subjects, who acknowledge permanent differences between us, and who sense our spiritual loneliness? Perhaps Rav Soloveitchik believed that we could. It may be that is what he attempted to do when he revealed his inner spiritual life as a lonely man of faith to Catholics and Jews in Brighton. And this assumption helps explain the purpose of part one of confrontation. Part two, which I've discussed, was sufficient to articulate the dangers and set the policy for interfaith discussion. But what did Rav Soloveitchik wish to achieve in the philosophic part one, which outlines three levels of existence? The first is the natural or non-confronted man who sees himself indistinct from the natural order, the is, and knows no moral norms, the ought. Clearly, this is the pagan of antiquity and the hedonistic power-driven esthete of, of our time. The second level is the reflective man who feels confronted by an objective order standing in opposition to himself and thus discovers his identity as a singular I. He senses the, the disparity between reality and perfection, between fact and value, 
And recognizing his power as a knower, he exploits his intellect as an instrument of conquest over his environment. He lives a life of power relations. He relates to others in Sartre-like fashion as vanquished objects, not personal subjects. He knows no true communication, only the depersonalized relationship of Adam to the beasts in the field as found in Genesis chapter 1. The third level is redemptive man who foregoes denomination, uh, domination and thereby achieves human relationships with others as equals. In the process of approaching Eve as a peer, Adam of Genesis chapter 2 discovers in-depth communication, his own identity, and God. Through Adam and Eve, though Adam and Eve remain distinct, they, remain, they retain their independent existential integrities. Together, they achieve a spiritual community with God. Now, to whom is this philosophic excursus addressed? Its invocation of two Adam types echoes Christian scriptures in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. Its typological reading of holy text is a classic Catholic exegetical technique. And its celebration of the word as a mysterious, creative, almost cosmic force calls to mind the logos of the New Testament. For Rav Soloveitchik, who was au courant with Christian theology, these were no coincidences. Evidently, Rav Soloveitchik wrote part one with Christian theologians in mind. He clearly viewed Christianity with his, his, its historic drive to conquer Judaism and depersonalize Jews as functioning on the second level of being. If so, then it may be that Rav Soloveitchik was inviting the church to ascend to the third level of existence by recalling, recoiling from its posture of domination vis-a-vis -vis Judaism. If Rav Soloveitchik could not have predicted the revolution started by Nostra, Nostra Aetate, perhaps he was able to dream of its possibility. Such an elevated level of existence would enable in-depth communication and comradeship, although not existential union or dissolution of the profound differences between Jews and Christians. When two faith communities meet each other as redemptive communities, dialogue is logically possible and even spiritually desirable. I have argued that for the last 40 years, the Catholic Church has undergone a profound transformation regarding Jews and Judaism, a transformation from Rav Soloveitchik's second level to third level of existence. If so, like Adam and Eve, we can begin to forge a subject-to-subject -subject relationship as a faith community to a faith community. Now finally, some caveats are necessary. Because of our troubled history and disparate theologies, Jewish-Christian theological dialogue is filled with pitfalls and problems. To guard against them, we should exercise care and explicitly agree on the preconditions and protocols of dialogue before beginning the precarious journey. Dialogue also does not progress linearly, and it is likely that Jews and Christians will experience both forward movement and withdrawal as Rav Soloveitchik was so fond of describing the spiritual life. Lastly, traditional Jews are largely unfamiliar with dialogue, and few are trained in theology. And therefore, we need to proceed slowly and meticulously with consummate honesty. Theological dialogue is no experience for those who lack deep conviction or pride in their faith, for those who have little knowledge of their hallowed traditions, or for those who have political or social goals that eclipse theological integrity. Such persons will achieve only a polite trading of favors or a dangerous syncretism that both Judaism and the church must resist. As Abraham Heschel said, the first prerequisite of interfaith dialogue is faith, to which I would add the second prerequisite is religious knowledge and the third, spiritual integrity. If Jews and Christians take the necessary precautions and approach true interfaith dialogue with religious strength and spiritual humility, they can both call the name of the Lord. When they do so, they help create a world in which God is present, a world closer to the messianic dream described by Rav Soloveitchik's great spiritual teacher, Maimonides, who writes, in that time there will be neither war, nor jealousy, nor rivalry, but goodness will pervade the earth. The entire world will be involved in the knowledge of God, as it is said in Isaiah chapter 9, quote, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as waters cover the sea. Thank you.
get my home email. What? It's the guy. Oh, not the one we said. I know, I know. Oh, okay. Well. Okay, so it's fun if you're cold now for years. <laughs> well, that's... Let's uh, reconvene. Oh, oh, oh. And we have three okay. scholars who have prepared yeah, yeah. who have prepared uh, prepared responses to Dr. Korn's uh, presentation, and. After we have those three responses, we'll judge by the number of sleepy eyes in the room whether we need another another break. Uh, but if you do need to get up and get yourself some more caffeine, it will be there in any case. Uh, so let me introduce the. They're going to walk out on you, Phil. Right? Okay. Um, <laughs> the let me introduce the three respondents now, and then they will speak in turn. The first will be Professor David Berger, who is and I forgot to ask him how to pronounce it. The Brooklyndian. It's a Dutch name, so Dutch I don't know how to pronounce it either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, professor in the history department at Brooklyn College, hence the Brooklyndian, I presume. Uh, he studied at Yeshiva College and also has uh, smicha, his Orthodox ordination, from the Rabbi Isaac Elkanan Theological Seminary there. And he received his MA and his PhD from Columbia University. His expertise, as many of us know from his many, many books, is in the history of medieval Jewry and Jewish-Christian relations, messianic ideas and movements, the intellectual history of Jews and of contemporary Orthodox Judaism. So he can speak to many of the aspects of the Jewish-Christian relationship from perspective of a historian, a practitioner, and a person who's very much involved in our world today. He's also the immediate past president of the Association for Jewish Studies, which for those of you who don't know, is the academic association uh, for people engaged in Jewish studies, and is a member of the executive committee of the American Academy for Jewish, Re Jewish Research, a similar organization, uh, and vice chair of the academic advisory committee of the National Foundation for Jewish Culture. Uh, those, of us, those of you in the room who are my students have looked at parts of at least one or two of David Berger's books. The most, uh, I'll mention just a few of them. The Rebbe, the Messiah, and the Scandal of Orthodox Indifference uh, is the most recent, uh, looking at what's going on in the contemporary Lubavitch world. And uh, the one that shows up in my courses more often, uh, The Jewish-Christian Debate in the High Middle Ages, a critical edition of the Nitzachon Vetos with an introduction, translation, and commentary. <coughs> so David will speak first. The second response will be from Rabbi Aryeh Clapper, who is a graduate of Yeshiva University uh, with an MA in Bible from the Revel School, uh, the Revel School Graduate Studies there, and ordination smicha from the Rabbi Isaac Elkanon Theological Seminary. Uh, he is full time now at Harvard Hillel, uh, working as the Orthodox Rabbinic Advisor there. Uh, and working t on planning various levels of programming at Hillel. Uh, he came to my attention, though, not through that context so much, since I live on the other side of the river, uh, but through his work with the Summer Beit Midrash, which is a study opportunity mostly for college students uh, who spend the summer studying Jewish studies studying Talmud intensively, moving around from one synagogue to another in the Jewish community. And we've had, in my community here in Newton, have had the pleasure not just of having the Beit Midrash be in residence, but of Rabbi Clapper's uh, teaching us when he's in town. And uh, I know that he's a, a fine teacher and somebody whose ideas were pertinent and important to this context. Uh, third, and the hardest person for me to introduce, is the person I work with on a daily, almost on a daily basis, is Professor Philip Cunningham, uh, who is the director of our Center for Christian Jewish Learning. Professor Cunningham has a PhD in religious education for the in, from the Institute of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry here at Boston College, with an emphasis on Bible. Uh, Relevant to our discussion here is that he has dedicated his career to the furthering of relationships between Catholics and Jews. And he is one of the leading voices on the American scene and in the international scene in Catholic Jewish relations. He's the author of numerous books, many of them with Shalom in the title. Uh, and many of these books are seeking to educate Catholics about 
the implications of the changing thinking of the Catholic Church, and also thinking about how to move these new teachings to higher and better integrated levels within Catholic thinking. Uh, so with that, let me invite Professor Berger first to respond to, Professor, to Dr. Korn's uh, speech. Thank you. Um, okay. Confrontation is a characteristically brilliant, highly influential, and notoriously problematic work. While Rabbi Soloveitchik addresses a number of pragmatic issues clearly, and to my mind, presciently, he also makes an apparently unqualified assertion that matters of religious faith cannot, in principle, be communicated. Thus, interfaith dialogue should not, and really cannot, deal with theological issues. Its only proper subject is the realm of the secular order expressed in the pursuit of social justice and related concerns. Uh, as Dr. Korn notes, serious readers have raised two fundamental and apparently insuperable objections to these formulations. In his, in his written version, he wrote readers. I wrote serious readers, and I noticed when he said it orally, he said academic readers. So from this, I deduce that academic and serious are synonyms. <laughs> um, in any case, those readers uh, have raised two fundamental and apparently insuperable insuperable objections. He actually uh, noted only one of them in his oral presentation, the other he had in a footnote. Uh, first, the assertion of the intrinsic incommunicability of matters of faith leads to, or is already, a reductio ad absurdum. Great religious works have been written through the ages by members of disparate faiths, and Rabbi Soloveitchik himself read many of them. Indeed, he was influenced by many of them, and not just on the level that he describes as cultural, a level where even secular thinkers can enjoy and cherish, he says, religious insights. To make matters worse, he says that the individual encounter between God and man cannot even be communicated to another individual in the same faith community. Thus, theological discussion among Jews would also be impossible. Second, there is a much quoted footnote in Confrontation that Dr. Kuhn described in a, in, in a section he didn't read as the assumed Achilles heel of confrontation, affirming that to the man of faith, the so-called secular order is also sacred. And this footnote uh, underscores the artificiality, so the critics say, of any sharp division between theological and non-theological matters. At least I think you didn't read that orally, am I right? Uh, great thinkers do not write transparent nonsense. They do sometimes engage in rhetorical hyperbole. And the more obvious it is that the literal understanding of a hyperbolic assertion cannot be intended, the more an author has the right to rely on the reader to understand this. But one must also be careful not to denude the rhetoric of all meaning to the point where it says something so removed from its presumed intent that the formulation uh, misses the point entirely. Dr. Kuhn then is surely correct in his contention that the plain meaning of Rabbi Soloveitchik's assertion of total incommunicability must somehow be limited. He suggests then that the objection to theological dialogue was restricted to full-fledged religious polemic. Thus, Rabbi Soloveitchik assumed that the modern dialogue would differ very little from the medieval model in which Christians attempted to prove that Jesus was the Messiah and that Jewish law has no ongoing validity. This would be a, quote, theological duel to the death. Rabbi Soloveitchik's assertion that dialogue is absurd refers only to efforts to prove or disprove faith rationally. He objected then, or objected primarily, to doctrinal disputation. But we aren't told what the secondary objections may have been, though they are implied by the, frame, by, by, by the phrase primary objection. Now this is a neat and clean resolution of the problem. But as we shall see, I think it does too much violence to Rabbi Soloveitchik's language, as well as to other evidence. Dr. Korn goes on to argue that the major changes in Catholic teachings about Jews and Judaism since confrontation largely neutralize Rabbi Soloveitchik's concerns. Nostra Aetate itself confirmed the irrevocability of the election of the Jews. John, uh, Pope John Paul II made clear that the Old Covenant is not revoked. 
The establishment of diplomatic relations with Israel effectively recognizes the right of the Jewish people to its historic homeland. Anti-Semitism has been repudiated and denounced. Mission to the Jews has been eliminated. Influential Catholics consider Judaism salvific for Jews. And even Cardinal Ratzinger, who looks forward to the acceptance of Christianity by Jews, does not anticipate this before the end of days. Thus, there is no triumphalism, no efforts to convert, no disputation, no serious problem. Let me begin by conceding that Rabbi Soloveitchik was not entirely unconcerned by the residual problem of outright polemic. Dr. Korn correctly notes that he uses the term debate at one point, and I agree that the term is revealing. It is also clear that Rabbi Soloveitchik assumed that he was dealing, even on the eve of Nostra Aetate, with a thoroughly supersessionist Catholicism whose adherents were interested in converting Jews. But I cannot agree that the full intent of confrontation is exhausted by depicting it as a warning against engaging in old-fashioned disputation. First of all, Jews did not need such a warning. Second, it was perfectly clear even in 1963 and 1964 that the call for dialogue was not framed in disputational terms. Indeed, that is precisely why Rabbi Soloveitchik had to caution against it. Thus, the preliminary text, on, which was called on the attitude of Catholics toward non-Christians and especially toward Jews, uh, that was distributed at the second session of the Council on November 8, 1963, declared that, quote, since the Church has so much of a common patrimony with the synagogue, this Holy Synod intends in every way to promote and further mutual knowledge and esteem obtained by theological studies and fraternal discussions." Unquote. Third, Rabbi Soloveitchik provided guidance to the interfaith representatives of the Rabbinical Council of America for many years after Nostra Aetate. By then, it was perfectly evident that interfaith dialogue was not Barcelona-style disputation, that the parties were not engaged in medieval polemics about Isaiah 53 or the rationality of the Incarnation. And yet Rabbi Soloveitchik on the whole uh, held to his guidelines. The entire thrust of confrontation's inspirational rhetoric about the private character of the religious experience is incommensurate with an interpretation that sees it as a straightforward injunction against trying to prove your faith. The issue is explicitly communicating an experience, not demonstrating the truth of a position. In other words, Though the existential character of Rabbi Soloveitchik's stance, correctly noted by Dr. Korn, is indeed inimical, I agree with this, is indeed inimical to the notion that religious positions can be definitively proven, the larger argument is that the personal experience of faith cannot even be communicated. What can be communicated, I think, is intellectual apprehension of faith. The problem is that such communication is pitifully inadequate. This, I think, is the real thrust of Rabbi Soloveitchik's position. Of course, many elements of religious doctrine, of the content of religious belief, can be conveyed. The assertion that the great encounter between God and man cannot be communicated, applied by Rabbi Soloveitchik in the same breath even to individuals of the same faith, cannot mean that no theological discourse is possible. It means that the deepest level of the faith experience uh, the deepest levels of the faith experience are inaccessible to outsiders. And Rabbi Soloveitchik applies this to a collective of believers as well as to individuals. Thus, as much as theological propositions can be conveyed, as much as even religious emotion can be partially expressed, certainly the lonely man of faith uh, is an expression also of religious emotions, that which ultimately commits a person to God or a faith community to its particular relationship with God remains essentially private, leaving not only a lonely man of faith, but a lonely people of faith, a nation that dwells alone. Since Rabbi Soloveitchik believed that untrammeled interfaith dialogue presumes to enter into that realm, he declares it out of bounds. Even though dialogue among believers concentrating on social issues has a religious dimension, as that footnote of Rabbi Soloveitchik's notes, it does not presume to enter that innermost realm, 
and its value therefore outweighs its residual dangers, though dangers there may be. If I'm correct, then even theological discussion that knows its place, not easy to define, maybe I'll say something later in response to a, 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 an anticipated response, uh, even theological discussion that knows its place would not be subject to the most radical critique and confrontation. And in this general sense, I am in agreement with Dr. Korn. But it is critically important to recognize that the incommunicability of the ultimate religious commitment is not the totality of Rabbi Soloveitchik's argument, as Dr. Korn's paper itself does note. The very fact that he goes beyond that point lends credence to the view that he did not mean it as an all-encompassing delegitimation of any theological discussion. If he did, there would have been little reason to go further. But he does go further. And here his argument moves from the extreme rhetoric of philosophical absolutism to the penetrating, pragmatic, prescient insights that make confrontation an essay of ongoing relevance. Rabbi Soloveitchik worried that theological dialogue would create pressure to quote, a uh, quotation you've heard already, trade favors pertaining to fundamental matters of faith to reconcile some, in quotation marks, differences. He argued against any Jewish interference in the faith of Christians, both on grounds of principle and out of concern that this would create the framework for reciprocal expectations. Now the changes in Catholic attitudes detailed by Dr. Korn are real, welcome, and significant. But they do not, in my opinion, undermine these concerns. Quite the contrary, the trajectory of dialogue to our own day has confirmed the validity of Rabbi Soloveitchik's analysis to an almost stunning degree. It is precisely friendly theological discussion and not religious disputation that generates these dangers. All the more so when the discussion is formalized as a theological <coughs> encounter, not between individuals, but between communities. As I noted in a paper on Dabru Emet, which is posted on the, uh, this center's website, a prominent participant in the dialogue, Christian participant, with as positive an attitude toward Jews and Judaism as one could hope for, congratulated the Jewish theologians who authored that declaration which is a kind of an effort at the kind of theological uh, appreciation, as it were, of, uh, of uh, Christianity <coughs> from a Jewish perspective. The areas where, uh, where greater uh, agreement, understanding could be reached in theological discussion. The dialogue said this distinguished Christian uh, ecumenicist will be stymied if Christians affirm a theological bonding with Jews without an acknowledgement of such bonding from the Jewish side. Now that was said not as a criticism, it was said as welcoming uh, such an example of bonding. But it is a very strong affirmation of the dynamic that Rabbi Soloveitchik spoke about. Another example. Several years ago, I criticized the New York Board of Rabbis for inviting its members to participate in an interfaith prayer service in the main sanctuary of St. Patrick's Cathedral, asserting in an interview with the Jewish Week that although many Jewish authorities maintained that classical Christian theology is not considered idolatry for Christians, it is for Jews. In light of this, prayer in such a setting, I said, raises the most serious of issues to the point where no Orthodox rabbi should even consider participating. An important official in the New York Archdiocese wrote a strong letter of protest to the paper, and in a private letter to me, he complained about my expressing such an assessment of Christianity after all that Catholics had done to reassess their negative image of Judaism. In an article on uh, Dominus Jesus, another important, in this case, Christian document, I've already expressed my regret at using the term idolatry. I didn't explain the background. Uh, but I already expressed my regret at using the term idolatry, which is easily misunderstood in this context. But my correspondent was not mollified, even after he understood very well that I was not suggesting that Christians attribute divinity to icons. <coughs> Rabbi Soloveitchik's concern about the trading of favors pertaining to fundamental matters of faith could not be more clearly illustrated. And this is three years ago, maybe. 
maybe four. In that reaction to Dabru I met, I also cited an example, and by the way, I should note that the person who, who wrote this letter it was very actively involved in ecumenical matters. This is not a person who, uh, who, is, per, who is peripheral to these concerns. In that reaction to Dabru I met, 